Good morning, everyone. I'm back again here uh, to tell you about our speaker today. I am so delighted to be introducing Dr. Sharif Abdullah to you. Uh, some of you are in our summer book club series uh, that is wrapping up uh, over this uh, next week or so. Uh, Sharif is the author of the book, Creating a World That Works for All, uh, as well as many other wonderful works. Uh, the executive director of Common Way Institute uh, based out of Portland, Oregon, where he and I got to know each other uh, over the last uh, 15, 17 years, something like that. Uh, just as my ministry was starting, he was the keynote speaker in San Diego at a Center for Spiritual Living uh, convention. And uh, our organization had just adopted this vision uh, then this vision statement of creating a world that works for everyone. And we had him as our keynote speaker. I was captivated by what he had to say then, uh, immediately purchased the book and uh, struck up that friendship that has lasted all these years, including many, many hours uh, sitting at a coffee shop together. And I'm very grateful and blessed to have had that experience. And uh, that in impact continues to with me now, uh, starting with you all as we talk about where is SLCA going? Uh, what are we doing in the world? It has to begin on the foundation of understanding what it means to create a world that works for everyone. And this individual, his body of work uh, is one that I return to again and again and again to help me and to guide me in articulating what that vision might look like. He is an international uh, speaker, uh, published author and consultant uh, working with corporations, private and, uh, and nonprofit um, governments uh, to bring peace and justice and harmony into the world all through the work of understanding our conscious uh, engagement in inclusivity and out the outward picturing of creating a world that works for everyone. So please help me welcome today uh, Dr. Sharif Abdullah as our speaker. Well, thank you, and uh, thank everyone who's uh, listening to this. And yeah, you know, I want to spend a little bit of time with us uh, very early this Sunday uh, morning. This is uh, uh, the sun has risen here in Portland, Oregon. Um, but uh, yeah, I want to I want to talk to you about uh, what the problem is. I want to talk to you about what the solution is. And then I want to talk to you about what the pathway to this solution is. Um, I don't, uh, you know, we, if we had four or five hours, we could do uh, a lot of work together. Uh, we don't have four or five hours. We've got uh, some minutes. And so uh, I'll do the best I can. Um, and uh, I look forward to talking uh, more with you uh, this coming Wednesday with uh, Reverend uh, David Alexander uh, as we continue our coffee house conversations uh, with more people at the table than the two of us. Um, so I want to get started uh, this morning by reading something to you by um, uh, the late President Václav Havel, the president of the Czech Republic, uh, while he was still alive, he um, honored me by agreeing to put the, to do the introduction to my book, Creating a World That Works for All. Uh, and in the introduction, uh, President Havel says, humankind today is well aware of the spectrum of threats looming over its head. We know that the number of people living on our planet is growing at a soaring rate. We know that the already deep abyss separating the planets poor and rich could deepen further. We also know that we've been destroying the environment on which our existence depends and that we're headed for disaster by producing weapons of mass destruction and allowing them to proliferate. And yet, even though we're aware of these dangers, we do almost nothing to avert them. Well, we could consider this to be a very um, uh, eloquent and uh, even poetic way of saying that we're all stuck on stupid. We see what's happening in the world and we act like it's not happening to us. We see people drilling holes in, the, in, in, in their end of the lifeboat 
thinking that this uh, that these holes are not going to affect us, then the boat goes down and everybody is surprised. What we have to recognize, though, is that all of these social issues that we're caught up with uh, today, going from racism, going through COVID, going through a broken economy, going through our, our uh, climate change crises, that all of these things are sourced in one place. We've got one problem. I'm going to suggest to you that we also have one solution. And that one solution is something that all of us can do. That all of us in this conversation right now, in this community right now, are doing. My goal is to help you to see this clearer, to deal with it more directly, to have it uh, more focused. So in my book, uh, in creating, uh, I've got a few, a few books, but in creating a world that works for all, I talk about the interconnected challenges that we have as, as, as people, we have as a society. Um, I call these challenges the mess. Um, and uh, the, the, we know what these challenges are. Um, the, the, cha the challenges look like population explosion, suicide, holes in the ozone layer, political corruption, homelessness, emotional stress. You, know, you, can, you can read them all yourself. I'm suggesting something to you that it, although that looks like 50 or 80 or 100 different presenting symptoms, it's all the same problem. And that problem is a problem of consciousness. The problem is what is lying here and here. We have to stop thinking about consciousness as being something that resides in my head. We have to start thinking about consciousness as being this interplay of what of head and heart and guts. And once we see the fullness of ourselves, then we can see the fullness of the problem. And then we can see the fullness of the solution. And so our challenge is in this world we've got where we're facing these elements in different ways, how we address our challenges with COVID is different than how we address our challenges in the aftermath of the George Floyd murder. What we have to learn how to do, what we have to learn, what we have to, to, to teach ourselves to do is to see all of this with one eye. Uh, You'll excuse me, that, that was my alarm clock. It's time for me to get up. <laughs> um, so, so how we see things with, with one eye, how we see the challenges differently, that becomes our challenge. We have a, a policy, and this, this is a policy that is throughout, that, that all Americans are doing it and probably all Westerners are doing it. And that policy is, I'm going to fix our problems by making that guy over there act different, okay? Um, I'm going to ask him to act different. I'm going to protest him if he doesn't act different. Some of us are, are willing to pick up weapons and guns and kill that guy over there because he or she is the source of all the problems. I want to suggest to you that, that doesn't, it doesn't work that way. That each one of us is holding a piece of this consciousness. And each one of us is holding a piece of the solution. When I stop trying to get 
that guy over there to, to, to act. When I recognize that I have the power and therefore I have the responsibility to act, once I do that, once I recognize that, I can take a deep breath. <clears throat> I can look at what my responsibility is in this situation, and then I can act accordingly. If you can see a problem in front of you, if you can actually see the problem, then it's your problem to solve. It's not, their, it's not just their problem. So my challenge has been, as I've traveled around the world, the first time you go around the world, you come back and you brag. Hey, I've been around the world, you know. The second time you've been around the world, you say, I've been around the world twice. Somewhere around the seventh or eighth or ninth time you go, it's like, oh, God, I got to go around the world again. And so, that, so that's uh, kind of how I, um, uh, I, 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 I operate toward going around the world. And when I've done that, and uh, there's some people who only go to um uh they go to they say they go to another country but they only go to the international hotel that serves the breakfast that they're used to in whatever country they just came from um i don't do that uh i've been to 45 different countries but i've probably been to 120 130 different cultures and going to another country means understanding the people understanding the challenges, understanding the conditions. And you can't do that while you're sitting in your air-conditioned limousine, you know, hotel limousine, while you're sitting on the beach while some brown-skinned person is bringing you your latest drink, okay? You've, in order for you to see the world, you actually have to open your eyes. So I want, to, I want to talk to you a little bit about opening our eyes. Something just happened to me uh, just a couple of days ago. Um, here in the state of Oregon, like almost every state, um, there, there are um, winners and losers in this, this COVID crisis. Uh, the winners are people who are making big bucks, who are making lots and lots of money from the existence of the problem. They don't want the problem to go away. They want to manage it. The losers are the people who have, were at the line when the economy started falling. They are in free fall right now. They, they don't have uh, the resources to survive. They don't, they don't they have a roof over your head, food to eat, Etc. I'm very um, aware of this because that's how I grew up. Um, we, I grew up in Camden, New Jersey, uh, worst city in America. We're number one. I grew up in the worst parts of the worst city in America. I grew up on welfare, in public housing, the whole nine yards. And I know what that feels like. I know what that, what that does to you. And I also know what it feels like to see people who have been blessed with more and do nothing. They just think, oh, I'm entitled to this and I'm, and I'm just going to go about my life. If you believe that, you're like a lot of the people that I've met around the world who believed that until the crisis caught up with them. So this is like the Titanic that's hit the iceberg. And some of the decks are already underwater. But not my deck. I'm fine. I'm, you know. I, I, I don't have any, um, you know, I've got money in the bank. I, you know, my mortgage is being paid or it's already paid off. Uh, I'm okay. So that means 
that my world is okay, that means everybody else is is operating from something else. I was in Argentina when their economic system went through the floor. So right now, I want you to do a mental inventory where you are, and I want you to think about how much cash you have in your wallet, how much cash you've got in your pocketbook, how much cash you've got in your house right now, okay? Now, assume that that's all the money that you've got in the world. All of your uh, bank deposits, gone, overnight, just, it's gone. All of your CDs, all of your, your stocks and bonds, everything is gone. And the only thing that you've got in the world is the cash that's in your pockets. And I watched what people, what formerly middle, comfortably middle class people do when the banking system died in one day. People, my friends were telling me how they were going to, my friends in Argentina were telling me how they were uh, going out for, you know, uh, dinner and dancing. They stopped by the ATM to try to, to pick up some cash. And the, the ATM machine takes their card forever. Whatever you thought you had in the bank, it's gone. Now, I watched formerly middle-class people eating out of garbage cans, pulling through other people's garbage cans, looking for something that's edible. I, I don't want to say this to bring you down or to, um, uh, you know, traumatize you or anything like that. I'm saying this to you because there's something you can do right now before that happens. I'll get to that something in a minute. I was in... Russia right after the collapse of the Soviet Union. I watched as people struggled with trying to figure out what their political system is now that that one is dead. We know that one over there is dead. What are we going to do? How are we going to live? How are we going to connect with each other? How are we going to come together in community? Our challenge is, how do we actually act like we are, are connected to each other? How do we actually act like we are brothers and sisters? How do we actually create an economy, create a political structure? create a social structure, create a spiritual structure that lasts more than Sunday, or maybe, maybe you can add Wednesday to it, but, but permeates your entire society, even the people who are not like you. Um, I do a lot of consulting work and people call me into organizations when the organization needs to be practicing more inclusivity, more we are one. Generally, I get called in when um, the organization has experienced some problem with practicing inclusivity. And um, I generally get called in when the organization has some some issue regarding either racial discrimination, gender discrimination, sexual orientation discrimination. And I get a chance to talk to um, some of the people that we read about in the news, the, 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 what, what gets billed as the uh, white supremacists, etc. And I get an opportunity 
to work at transforming them. Let me give you a really quick example of that. Um, and, and because of the state of litigation, et cetera, I can't tell you where this is, but it's an, on a, um, uh, a city on the West Coast. And um, they are a small town on the West Coast, and it had um, um, uh, it's it's a particular workforce. And I'm I, I, I'm skirting around trying to the, the the description of the workforce, but so it, it's a, a small town, small workforce, and um, this particular workforce is all white, uh, all white males. And they had an Hispanic person come into the workforce. And they started treating him the same way they treat themselves. Now, what I just said is really, really important. They treated him the same way they treat themselves. They put each other down. They denigrate each other. They call each other offensive names. Ha, ha, ha. We're just having fun. So this guy comes into the workforce and they start calling him offensive names and their offensive names were racial. He starts calling the names right back and they just think they got a new buddy now. So um, they're calling him, you know, Beaner and Spick and Wetback and he's calling them Cracker and Hunky and they all go out and have beer together. They all go to dinner together. They visit each other's families while constantly putting each other down. So a year goes by, and this guy's a temporary worker for the year. So, and, and at the end of the year, for some reason, they don't give him a permanent job, so they have to let him go. He goes out and he gets his lawyer, and they file a lawsuit, and this city, in its wisdom, settled that lawsuit before the ink was dry. They knew they, hadn't, they didn't have a leg to stand on. They just kind of asked them, how many zeros do you want on your check? And then they brought me in. And to work with the people in this work, in this work group, uh, the dozen people in the work group, um, who were the chief name callers putting, the, you know, putting, putting this guy down. Now, they gave me four hours to work with them. What? So you walk in, you, I'll put you in my place. You walk into the room and you've got one of the most hostile audiences you, you care to name. They, do, they didn't believe they did anything wrong. They, want, they didn't want the city to settle the suit. They wanted to go to court and clear their name. And you've got four hours. What would you say to them? What would you uh, suggest to them? At the end of the four hours, 11 of the 12 said, I now see what we did wrong. I now know to do something different. I am pledging myself to do something different, to, 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 to operate from a different level of reality. Four hours. Um, I could do that. Well, you, there's two different definitions of why I can do that. Uh, definition number one is I'm really Superman and I can rip off my shirt and there's a big S on my chest and I can fly through the sky, et cetera. Um, that's not, <laughs> that's, that's not uh, the one. The reason I can do that is because I've done the work on myself. I know that this being is not isolated from them. If I'm talking about we are one, then I've got to be one with all of you who are listening to this. I also have to be one with all of the thems of the world. 
And instead of blaming, shaming, making wrong, making bad, I get to have the superior position while they are the problem. What I can do is understand them, understand them to the point that 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 I can I can help them to see themselves. I can help them to connect deeply with themselves. So I said I had an, an experience uh, the other day, and I want to I want to share this experience with you. So because of the economic wreckage by uh, the, of the mishandling of COVID, um, the people in this state are in, 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 some people in the state are in really, really uh, uh, deep trouble. And so what I, um, what the state has done um, is uh, giving people who meet certain criterias uh, an emergency check for $500. And so I was walking from here to go to the bank and then from the bank to go to the post office, my, my kind of my route, uh, my exercise route. And I see this line of people, almost all of them black. And this is a rare occasion in a city as white as Portland, Oregon. And I notice a couple of so I notice a couple of things about the line. Number one, the the line is probably ninety nine percent black. It goes on about two blocks because this ba the bank that they're lined up in front of is the bank that process is processing these emergency checks. The second thing I notice is. No one is practicing social distancing and not one person out of this couple hundred people has a mask on. Now, I cross the street. I walk on the other side of the street. And there are some, uh, the bank security guards are asking people to line up and be patient, etc. You're also trying to stretch people out, like practice social distancing, etc. And people are looking at him like he's crazy. Now, in the world of blaming and shaming, we look at the higher the, the the fact that African Americans have a higher COVID um, uh, uh, rate than others in our society, and say, "Well, the problem must be white people because there's a problem." And I say, "The problem is all of us." If I only point to half of the problem, the problem won't get solved. If I only look at the problem of police behavior, I don't look at the problem of the suspect's behavior. All of the problems need to be resolved. So I'll tell you another problem, and then I'll tell you, tell you how um, you, each of you uh, uh, listening to me, you are the solution. Uh, I was doing a workshop in um, um, with one of the centers for spiritual living here in the Portland area, and one of the women t women there told me a story. This is something that happened a couple of years ago. She said she was in um, uh, waiting for a bus at the um, one of the intersections of our of our black community. So she was at. Martin Luther King and Killingsworth Street. And there was a young black man with a knife out, the, the blade out. And he's running around the intersection, stopping cars and running up to people. And he, he's either holding the knife out to them or holding the knife at his own throat, saying, I want to die. I want to die. I want the cops to come here and kill me. I, and and <clears throat> this woman checked in with herself and asked herself, 
Is this something I'm supposed to deal with? And the answer is yes. So she, and, and I guess she's, she's not a big woman. She's not a strong woman. She actually has a, a fairly mild personality. She walked over to him and she said, what you're doing right now is not helpful to anything. Come over here and sit with me on this bench and talk to me about what the problem is. She, he's yelling and screaming at her. My girlfriend thinks I'm a loser. I caught her with another man. And she said, right now, you're acting like a loser. So why don't you come over here, put the knife away, and, um, and talk to me? He, because, okay, because she was calm. She was focused. He got that focus from her. He put the knife away. He walked over to the bench. He starts talking about his situation. And the police arrive. Now, one of the things this woman knew was if the police came and he had a knife and was actively ch chasing people, they had one choice. They had to stop him. And the tools that we, all of us, have given the police to stop people are very limited. They were able to come over to him without guns drawn, talk with him, and they took him to get, not to, not to jail, but they took him to get some uh, mental health care. Now, she did all this before her bus came. She defused this situation simply by being the person that she is. I diffused 11 of the 12 people in the room with me by being, by understanding who I am, by understanding who they are, by not having an attitude that says, I'm better than you, or I've, I've, I've seen more than you. I can do that because there is an active practice of we are one. Not a theoretical practice. I'm talking about every day when I'm walking down the street, I can practice we are one. I'm talking about every day I can work toward the development of community. This is the, the consciousness elevation that I'm talking about. I, I know there are many people on the call that talk about we are one and we're all brothers, etc. And as soon as they do that, I just say two words to them, Donald Trump. And if you can't see that Donald Trump is your brother, you've got work to do. There's this Hindu um, uh, saying that, I can I I learn how to look at a heap of gold and a heap of dung of dog shit with the same eye. How many of us see the gold and we want it, we want it? And how many of us see the dog mess on your shoe and you're doing everything you can to scrape it off and you're not seeing it? You're not getting it. So once I walk into the room, not with a dozen racists, but with a dozen people who don't understand what's happening, as I have not understood what is happening. Once I do that, I can help them by helping me to see this reality at a deeper level. Okay, uh, uh, one more story. Um, I think that's all I got time for. Um, this was something that happened uh, maybe a couple of years ago. Uh, I was talking with a woman, and um, uh, she, this is an African-American woman who had bought some land uh, either in Pennsylvania or Ohio. And when she bought the land, she knew that her neighbors, um, the, the land next to her, 
uh, were people who were members of the Amish community. And she didn't think anything about it. Like, okay, you know, um, uh, I'm, 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 I like the land, so she bought, she bought the land. Um, within a week of, of her moving in, she got a visit from these women in the Amish community. And, you know, hello, you're our neighbor, and we have a welcome basket for you. And they had um, some jams and jellies, and they had some butter they had made, and they, they, they visited for a while. Welcome to our community. She thought this was really nice. The next week, same women come by, and they bring more jams and preserves, they bring a little bit more food, and they bring some, brought something that they had crocheted. And um, the third week they come by and they, and they say, you know, we're about to put up some uh, preserves. You're welcome to join us if you want to, you know, kind of learn how to do this. And she said, at the third visit, she got it. The one thing they did not want is a dependent neighbor. They wanted a neighbor who would be interdependent with them. They wanted a neighbor who would, who would practice um, the, their own interdependence that they don't need this society. If the society tanked overnight, like it did in Argentina, somebody would have to drive out and tell the Amish that because they wouldn't notice. Uh, I've been in, in many, many places in the world where people live very rich, experientially rich lives. What we need to do is recognize that this new society brings about a new wealth. Our wealth used to be measured by how many zeros were in your bank account. I'm suggesting to you that our new wealth is how many communities you are connecting to, how many times you are going to be connecting to community. <clears throat> Okay, I said that that was my, my uh, last story, but let me give you one more. I was working, I did a lot of work in uh, Sri Lanka, and, we, and on Wednesday, when Reverend David and I are talking, um, the, during the after the sermon talk, we, we, I may get into some of that. But one day, I, was, I had to go downtown uh, the, into the capital city, and you, I, I don't know if you've ever had that pissy day where you are just, everything goes wrong. Everything that you want goes wrong. I'm looking for something. Um, um, uh, I can't find it. I, I'm, I have to walk from one um, uh, store to another, and it's hot, and it's smelly, and it's, I'm dripping in sweat. And everything is focused on, me, 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 me. So I'm walking along and I see a man who uh, is suffering the ravages of leprosy. Um, his le leprosy eats off your fingers and your toes. And so he's standing in this loincloth and he's got, he's standing in front of this old Dutch reformed church. And he, he has his, his hands up in supplication. And he's praying. And he's praying in his language, uh, which is either Sinhalese or Tamil. I don't speak either one. I can't even hear the difference between them. And the one thing I absolutely know by, by standing there with him is that he is praying for someone who is not as fortunate as he is. We spend all of our time focused on me, me, me. What we have to learn is that to start thinking 
in community. Thinking in the community of people who agree with you. People, thinking in the community of people who like you. Thinking in the community of people who share your DNA. And then start thinking in the community of people who know nothing about you, who have heard terrible things about you, and um, you and who think of you in being a be, think of you in a hostile way. As Reverend David knows, I can go on like this for a few more hours, but I'm not. What I do want to do is um, uh, leave you with a prayer. And the prayer is something that I can pra that I practice around the world. The prayer is something that you can practice with people who um, are not particularly religious, who don't necessarily believe in God the way you do or believe in God at all. And this prayer is a modification of a Buddhist prayer. And the, the Buddhist prayer goes, um, may all beings be well, may all beings be secure, and may all beings be happy. My modification of that prayer is three parts. The first part is, may I be well, may I be secure, may I be happy. You remember from the airplane, put the oxygen mask on yourself first, then you can help others. You're in no position to help anybody else when you're about to pass out. The second part of the prayer is, may you be well, may you be secure, may you be happy. And when you say you, I want you to think about two different kinds of people. Who is the person that is the easiest for you to wish that prayer to? Probably your children, probably your spouse, probably people that, that are in your DNA line, um, probably members of your church. Then, who's it the hardest for you to wish well, for you to wish to be secure and you to wish to be happy? That could be Donald Trump. That could be uh, your next door neighbor. Uh, it could be people in your DNA line. And then the third part of the prayer is, may all beings be well. And by all beings, I mean all of them, the green ones, the ones that are swimming in the sea, uh, et cetera. So I, I, I wish that to you, and I will end now with, may I be well, may I be secure, may I be happy. May you be well, may you be secure, may you be happy. May all beings be well. May all beings be secure. May all beings be happy. Thank you. Mm. Thank you, Dr. Sharif Abdullah. I, I hope everybody can see now um, why I love this man so much, appreciate his teachings, because uh, he's always holding our feet to the fire, right? It's easy to, to sing about new thought principles of oneness. It's a bit more difficult to practice them sometimes in a world that is so polarized. And so I have been uh, sitting at the feet of this teacher for many years and for good reason. I hope you see uh, the value uh, that I find in uh, and listening to him, even though he goes on to say, well, I've got one more story. I know he says he's not Pentecostal, but uh, uh, <laughs> maybe he's got a little Pentecostal roots in there too. But that's all right. This community is used to that for me. So uh, we're going to dive in uh, next uh, Wednesday, this coming Wednesday, uh, to unpackage all of that. So please bring your questions. I know I've got some, and I'm sure you do too, uh, from all the dialogue I'm seeing in the chat box. Right now, we want to do our affirmation for grateful giving and remind you again uh, the, the beautiful impact that your gift is having in this community. Uh, one of our pledges wrote in and told us, I am a pledger because I understand the importance of my gift to ensure that SLCA has all the support that it needs in creating a world 
that works for everyone. What a perfect message uh, for today. Your gifts do indeed uh, contribute to this vision of creating a world that works for everyone and creates a place, right? A place and, and a space. I've been distinguishing between, between those two things lately, right? Place and space. SLCA is a place, but it's also a space that we are creating in consciousness. Uh, and so your gift secures the place and the space in consciousness to be uh the, the 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 space where this work happens right where we get to engage and examine and practice these beautiful principles so uh text to give uh 404-800-9467 or go to our website slca.com donations and you'll find all the alternative ways to contribute there all of the gifts that we receive, we are truly grateful and thankful for as they roll in throughout the week from our pledgers. Uh, we're so grateful for your contributions today and always. Let's affirm together. Take a breath. Thinking about the connection that you have to the gift that you are circulating into this community. And let's affirm together. I live in a universe of abundance. As I freely and joyfully give I join in the divine flow and all that I share with life returns to me multiplied abundantly. And so it is. So it is.